Okay, welcome back after the break. Just before we went for our break, we were looking at who the Son of God is. We're looking at him uh, from eternity, uh, in eternity, time and space, and trying to understand and see who this eternal uh, God is. And we're looking at various scripture passages that reveal to us, you know, who um, the Son of God is or who uh, God is uh, even who was there even before the beginning. Uh, we looked at uh, him as one who is eternal, one who is self-existent, infinite, has all the wisdom. And uh, just before we went for our break, we looked at that he is the triune God. The next characteristic or the attribute of this uh, eternal God uh, who was there even before the beginning is that he is a God of love. Uh, there was, we, we see in the scripture passages that, you know, there was love in the Godhead, uh, love amongst themselves. And also we see that love defined uh, the relationship of the Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit. And also love defined the relationship that the God the Son had with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And also love defined the relationship that God the Holy Spirit had with God the Father and God the Son. And we see this in John chapter 4 verse 8 where it says that God is love. And also John chapter 17, verse 24, uh, which is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. So can one of you please read John chapter 17, verse 24, please? Ma'am, John chapter 17. Twenty-four. Yes, who's reading? Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here we see that you know there was love that exists with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also see that this God is a God who has life in himself. Uh, he is the source of eternal life. He, is the, uh, he has immortal life. And he is also the one who gives the God kind of life, the Zoe life. Uh, we read this in John chapter 1, verse 4. We've already looked at it in our previous uh, uh, lessons. And John chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So this God who existed even before the beginning is a God who has life in himself. He's a source of eternal life and immortal life. And he gives us the God kind of life. He is also a God who is light. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. Can one of you read that, please? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Thank you, Rin. So here we see that he is a God who is light. God is light and he lives in unapproachable light who no man can see or has ever seen. He is also, uh, you know, a God who is all in all. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one, the uh, lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. So he inhabits eternity. He is all in all. He is also the great I am. We studied quite a bit about this uh, 
title of God, uh, uh, the I am title of God, and we see that he is the great I am. Uh, he dwells in the eternal now, and also he lives outside of uh, time, okay? So that is something that we cannot comprehend or understand, but, you know, he's a God who lives in the eternal now, who uh, relates with our time, our space, but he also is a God who lives uh, outside of time, which means that you know, for him, time is irrelevant. He lives outside the realm of time and space. And that is why he says for him, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. Uh, and this verse just seems to convey to us, you know, uh, that this God, uh, it's not bound by time. Uh, time, as we know, does not matter to him. But, uh, you know, he is uh, the one who uh, dwells in the eternal now, but also lives outside of uh, uh, time. So before the beginning of time, even before uh, the creation of this world, the I am stood at the beginning and at the beginning of time as we know it. So. Uh, the I am was there at the beginning. He stood at the beginning uh, and he stood at the beginning of when time began uh, for us, so to say. Uh, and also he's the same I am who stands at the end of time as well. So he's the I am who stood at the beginning and at the ending of time as we know it, because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 46, was then that he declares the end from the beginning. So hence we can say that he stood at the beginning and at the same time he stood at the end and he declared everything that happened from the beginning uh, to the uh, end. Acts chapter 15 verse 18 says, known to God from eternity are all his works. So in the mind of God, God completed all of his works even before he uh, started it. Okay, even before he started it, he completed everything. He finished everything before even time uh, began. And that is why we say that this great I am stood at the beginning and at the ending of time as we know it. Uh, and as Isaiah says, he declares the end from the beginning which means even before things are even going to happen now or tomorrow or way into the future, he's already been there. He's already seen things. Uh, he already knows what is happening. And because he has already um, declared everything, because he stood at the beginning, he's also stood at the end and declared everything from start to finish, even before it started, even before it finished even before uh, 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 you know this world came to an end he's seen it all he knows it all he stood there he's uh, he knows everything like hebrews chapter 4 verse 3 says although the works were finished from the foundation of the world okay so uh, in god's mind you know he's seen everything from the end to the beginning even before the foundation of the world all the works were finished even before they even came to being even before um, we even see it happening uh, before our eyes or we will see it happening in the future so this is uh, who bible uh, reveals or who uh, scripture reveals to us is this god who lived even before the beginning of time this god who lives in eternity what are his characteristics what his attributes are is what scripture revealed to us is that he is uh, uh, eternal he is self-existent uh, he is infinite he is all wisdom he's a triune god uh, he's a god of love he's a god who is uh, has life in himself god is light he is all in all he's the uh, uh, i am and he is also the alpha and omega because he is the beginning and the end even before everything began even before everything comes to an end he has seen it he knows um, everything that is going to uh, happen because he's declared everything from uh, the end to the beginning or from the beginning uh, to the end. And he stood at the beginning, at the end, and declared um, everything. Okay. 
So what did this great I am or this this God, the son of God, you know, who was there even before the beginning, complete even before uh, it began to unfold in history? We just uh, uh, saw various scripture passages from uh, Hebrews 4.3, Isaiah 46.10, uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 18, where, you know, known to God from eternity are all his works. He declares the end from the beginning. All of the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, uh, what did this great I am uh, complete even before it began to unfold in history? Okay, so we look at a few things that scriptures reveal to us what this great I am completed even before it began to unfold in history. The first thing is that he created a family of people who would love and be loved by him. So he created a family of people who would be his sons and daughters who would who he would love and also be um, uh, who would uh, who would he would love and also that we would uh, love him so we see that this great I am you know decided to have a family of sons and daughters a people whom he would love and be loved by him uh, we read this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 uh, can one of you turn to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and read that for us please Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. So he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame uh, before him uh, in love. So we see that even before, uh, you know, uh, the beginning, what did uh, the great I am complete in his mind? He completed in his mind that he would have a family of people who would love and be loved by uh, him, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. The other thing this the great I am completed even before it began to unfold in history is that he decided that he will be our father. Okay, before we look at that point, Nina join uh, uh, has put in the chat section. These references that we are going through are not there in the notes. Yes, um, actually, uh, the notes have very limited uh, content in this last chapter on the Son of God. So what I've done is uh, I've gone to one of pastor's sermon titled The Son of God, which he preached on one Christmas um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Christmas Day. I forget which year it is, but it is there on the in the website. So you know, it had uh, a good content, and he also said it will be good if we can you know uh, uh, teach this in this course for this class. So that's what I've done. I've listened to the entire sermon. I've taken down. Uh, you know, type down all the notes and all of these references and these points, and that is what I'm sharing. So what you can do is you can go back and listen to this sermon, and um, you know, uh, you can refer to those notes that are there. Uh, but what I'll do is I can even um, post uh, this whole notes. Uh, Nina John. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear your last sentence. I was not able to hear. So we can get them all yeah, together, so, right? I mean, uh, all these references. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what I'll do is I, I've uh, listened to them and typed off all the things that he said, uh, but you know, not in in complete detail. I've uh, some of the things that he talks about creation and all of that. I've left those aspects. You can listen to that. Um, uh, but you know the major part of it uh, I have uh, put down here and that's what I'm teaching from so I will post this as the PDF notes is that fine all of you are able to hear me clearly is there any disturbance in the no no there isn't okay. uh, thank you yeah 
Huh. Okay. So we'll move on to seeing what the I am completed even before he began to unfold in history. We just said that, you know, he is the I am who has finished everything even before time began. He stood at the uh, beginning of time. He even stood at the end of time. He's seen everything. So what are those things that he has completed? The first thing we saw that he's created a family of people, or sons and daughters uh, who, he, who would love and be loved by him. The second thing is he decided that he will be our uh, father. So uh, this is what he completed in his mind even before the foundations of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So he decided that he would create these people as free moral beings, uh, create, but he would create them in his own image and likeness. However, he decided that even if he creates us in his own image and likeness, he will create us as free moral beings. And as free moral beings, he knew that it would be a problem for us. He knew that we would rebel and sin against him. And uh, uh, and he knew that we would give away and uh, you know uh, and move away from our relationship, our trust with him, and we will you know give ourselves to the enemy. We will become the slaves of Satan. Uh, he saw that sin would taint the world, uh, and you know, but he already in his mind saw all of these things. He knew all of these things, but in his mind he also had the plan of salvation and the plan of redemption already in place and he would he knew what would require uh, for us to be brought back to him to be redeemed back to him and so he already had the whole plan of redemption of salvation in his mind and not just that but the whole plan of redemption and salvation was already a completed and done thing in his uh, mind so you know when he saw that that the that sin would taint the world um you know and he would have to recover us redeem us back from sin satan and death you know there must have been a, a discussion uh, with the godhead just you know thinking about it in human terms there must have been a discussion in the godhead and the second person of the trinity the second person of the godhead the eternal word spoke up and said i will become that lamb to bear the sin uh, to take away the sin and bring back the people uh, who have gone away uh, to ourselves so it was the son of god who said that he would you know uh, fulfill this plan of redemption he would become that lamb of God. He would become that perfect sacrifice, would bear the sins and take away the sins and bring back uh, the people back to God himself. And so the, uh, the eternal word, uh, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, God the son, became the lamb of God even before the beginning of time. As we read in First Peter chapter 1, verse 20, and Revelation chapter 13, uh, verse 18, and someone else can read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. So can one of you please read First Peter chapter 1, verse 20, someone else can read Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, and someone else can read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. First Peter 1, 20, please. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Amen. So here we see that even before the foundation of the world, it was foreordained that uh, Jesus would, God would become incarnate. He would be the Lamb of God who take up on the sins, but it was made known to us in these last, uh, in last times or in our own day. It was revealed to us in history at the Kairos moment. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, please. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
Amen. So we see that because of the Lamb of God, we have the redemption through His blood, uh, freely by grace, and our sins are forgiven, and we are accepted uh, by Him, or we will be accepted in the Beloved. And another scripture reference, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Amen. Thank you, Nikhil. So we see that in Christ, this Lamb of God was foreordained even before the foundation of the world, you know, who said that he will take on the sins of the world and pay that redemption price through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. But even before Christ came and, you know, uh, even before sin came into the world, you know, uh, in the mind of God, in the heart of God, you know, he knew this was going to happen. He already put things in place and he even saw Christ finish the work, uh, the Son of God finish the work on the cross and the full redemption price that was already paid on the cross. So everything was completed in the mind and the heart of God even before it took place in um, history. The, the, the third thing that the great I am completed even before uh, the unfolding of it in history was that he adopted us as his sons and um, daughters. So the Godhead saw through time and they saw that some will accept uh, the Lamb of God and some will reject the Lamb of God. He foreknew or he knew beforehand who will choose him and who will forsake him, who will, uh, uh, you know, uh, choose the Lamb of God, who will believe in the Lamb of God and who will, you know, uh, uh, who would, uh, 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 will not believe, will refuse him. It's not that... Uh, uh, we're not saying that this is predestination. We're not saying uh, that, you know, God beforehand chose some to, you know, accept him, uh, some for eternal life, some for eternal hell, some for eternal damnation. He chose some to choose him, some not to choose him. No, uh, we know from scripture that it's, uh, it's uh, God's good, pleasing and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So it, uh, Paul writes to us about this in Romans. He says it's God's good, pleasing and perfect will that all men. Okay, so it does not mean that God has foreordained even before the beginning of time. He has chosen some for... Uh, you know, eternity for eternal life and some for damnation and some for hell. No, he created hell only for uh, the devil, but he has not created hell for you and me. But he knew even before time, he foreknew. He did not foreordain or he did not predestine, but he foreknew who is who are going to choose him and who are going to forsake him. So he already decided that those who are going to choose uh, the Lamb of God, believe in the Lamb of God, that once they choose him, that they would be made his sons and daughters and they would be transformed into the very image of the Son of God, which means they will be transformed back into their original position or state which God created them in his image and his likeness, which means that we will be transformed into Christ's likeness, transformed into the very image of the Son of God. So God decided that those who choose him will be conformed to the image of his Son, which is something that he already predestined, uh, preordained, pre, uh, uh, you know, confirmed this before time, that those who choose him will be conformed to the image of his son. But please note that it was not foreordained or predestined some to choose him and some to forsake him. No. You know, it's a, this, that is not true. There are various theologies on this, but Bible does not teach us this. Scripture does not teach us this. It's God's good will and uh, pleasing will that all men be saved. We know from John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him. So salvation is there for everybody. The work of salvation is completed, is done, but it's, you know, it's, is God's part is done. Our part is that we choose 
or believe in that and we receive that and when we receive that we become uh, sons and daughters i hope this point is very clear because there's a lot of controversy on predestination and saying that god chose some he refused some he um he you know, set some up for eternal life, some for hell. No, that's not true. But it was God's pleasing will that all men be saved. But the choice is left up to us. Like we see that, you know, he created us as in his image and likeness, but he made us uh, moral beings with the free will to choose. And that is why we see that, you know, he gave uh, Adam and Eve, he told them what they should be doing and what they should not do, but he did not stop them from, uh, you know, eating from that tree or, uh, 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 of good and evil, uh, even though he knew the disaster that's going to come, but he did not, uh, uh, you know, stop them because he'd given them the free moral will to choose. The gift of volition he's given us, uh, the free moral will to choose. So the choice is ours, but he does empower us. He does help us to make the right uh, choices. So let's read uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30. Can some one of you please read Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30, please? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here some people you know, take this uh, verses out of context. They don't see verse 29 where they say, for whom he foreknew, which means who he foreknew, what choice they're going to make, those he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. But what they read is it was 30, moreover whom he predestined, those he also called, whom he called, he also justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. But here we need to see that those who he foreknew is going to make the choice, who chooses the Son of God and believes in him, those he is called as his children, those he calls into his purposes, those uh, who make this choice of receiving salvation or believing the finished work of the cross, they are the ones who will be justified, they are the ones who will be made righteous, and they will also be glorified. So very important to see this in context. And verse 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, you know, which does not mean that uh, he's making his own choices. No, which if we say that, you know, then we can say God is partial and uh, he's not a partial God as we read, I think, in Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter 1. Um, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 11 says, for there is no partiality with God. You know, if you're saying God is partial, that means we can say that he is not you know, uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, there is some amount of sin. There is, he can't be partial. That's not who God is. Uh, that's not part of his very core nature, his attributes. And uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 11 very clearly says, for there is no partiality uh, with God. So, you know, and he does not, uh, you know, he gives us the free will to choose, but he knows beforehand the choices that he you make. He also knows the choices that you're going to make today. He knows the choices that you're going to make tomorrow and way into the future. He knows everything because he is God. So he did not, or he does not make the choice for us, but he foreknew our choice and he decided beforehand that those who make the choice of believing the Lamb of God will be conformed to the image of his son. They would be the ones who he is called, justified, and will also be uh, glorified. So in time, as we make the choice to believe in the Lamb of God, you know, we become those who are called, justified, and glorified. So, uh, but God already knew before the beginning of time, even before you and I were born, he knows the choices that we make. He knows the choice we make about salvation, and he knows the rest of the choices that we are making. Uh, you know, we are going to make in life. So this is what the great um, 
I am, you know, completed even before it, be, uh, you know, began to unfold uh, in history. A few more things what this great I am completed even before it began to unfold in history was the spirit of sonship, uh, the third person of the Godhead, you know, like what I was saying, we were this, uh, that the, the Godhead is discussing, okay, now we see that humans are going to sin, they're going to get into sin, become slaves of uh, Satan. And the, the eternal word said, I will become that Lamb of God. And uh, the third person of the Godhead, whom we know as the Holy Spirit spoke up and said, I will assist the eternal word in his mission and his redemption. I will anoint him, I will empower him, and I will raise him up from the uh, dead. So in the Godhead, you know, amongst themselves, they had the complete plan of redemption uh, in, in place, in order. It was already even completed, a done thing. And we see the Holy Spirit also said that I will be the spirit of adoption for those who will receive the Lamb of God and bring them into our uh, family. Like as we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. So can one of you please read Romans 8, 14 to 17, please? Romans 8, 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then hires, hires of God and join hires with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. Thank you, Vimal. So here we see that the Holy Spirit you know, says that if those who receive the Lamb of God believe in him, that he will do the work of bringing them into the family and assuring them that now they are sons and daughters of God. And this, the, hence the spirit always witnesses in our uh, spirit man that we are children of God, that we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, uh, even as we continue living on this uh, earth. Okay, and also, uh, what is the thing that was completed even before it became uh, began to unfold in uh, in history was the Book of Life, and so he wrote their names in the Book of Life, as we read in Revelation chapter thirteen, verse eighteen. Uh, so, can one of you please turn to Revelation chapter thirteen, verse eight, and one more can turn to Revelation chapter seventeen, verse eight. So it's Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, and um, Revelation 17, verse 8, please. All who dwell on the earth who worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Okay, thank you. So all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book, the Lamb, uh, uh, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And uh, can one of uh, you also read Revelation chapter 17, verse 8? The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here we see that the book was written, and our names are already written in the book of life, even before the foundation of the world as we see in these two uh, references it says you know on those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world so even before you know we made a uh, week we came into existence on this earth we were born into this earth on this earth sorry uh, you know and even before we made the choice you know god already knew 
who is going to make the choice and our names are already written in the book of life even before the foundation um, of the world we'll also look at a few more things what the i am completed even before it began to unfold in history he prepared a kingdom uh, which is a kingdom that he prepared for his sons and daughters. So the Godhead already decided that those who will receive the Lamb of God will be brought into his kingdom, will be ushered into his kingdom. They will inherit his kingdom and be hairs and joint hairs in the kingdom. As we read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, where it says, Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world okay so even before the foundation of the world you know god the god had decided that they will have they will have a kingdom and those who will believe in the lamb of god and what he has done on the cross will inherit the kingdom there will be hairs of god and co-hairs with christ jesus in the kingdom of god now all this um uh, was a mystery so you know because it was all done and completed in the mind of the great i am uh, the end from the beginning uh, was already completed and you know this was kept as a mystery as a secret uh, but you know um, uh, and it was a plan that only the godhead knew but they would they decided they would reveal this mystery this plan step by step at the right moment at the kairos moment in history and then you know finally the the final revelation uh would you know would totally be revealed to the church they would then reveal uh, uh progressively uh, all of these mysteries to the church so all the work was already done it was completed you know in the heart and mind of the godhead and then came the beginning and uh, then God created the heaven and earth and then you know he slowly started revealing his mystery his plan you know it began to unfold and step by step he is revealing everything that was even completed and done uh, in the heart and mind of the Godhead of the great I am even before the foundation of the world so everything was completed in the heart and mind of God and then was the beginning and uh, how did the beginning come into existence we know that god spoke uh, uh, and the worlds came into existence uh, we read this in psalms chapter 33 verse 6 and 9 we also read this in hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 where it says by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of god so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible and we see that the triune God worked together in creation. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit worked together uh, in creation to bring about uh, creation. Uh, we read this in uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and also Psalms chapter 104, verse 30. So can one of you please read um, John chapter 1 verse 3, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and 17, and Psalms chapter 104 verse 30, please. John chapter 1 verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Amen. So all things were made through him. Nothing was made that, uh, not, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. 
Amen. We already looked at, studied this uh, scripture passage. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And in him all things consist or all things exist. Psalm 104, verse 30, please. You send forth your spirit, they were created, and you renew the face of the earth. Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. So here we see that, you know, uh, the triune God worked together in perfect unity and oneness in uh, creation, in bringing about creation. And we also see the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in his uh, creation, you know, just as the work of an art uh, or an artist who's expressing uh, his skill, his uh, what he has in his mind. Uh, so just as work of art is an expression of the artist or the display of his skill is an expression of the, you know, of the artist. So also in creation, we see God expresses himself or creation expresses the attributes, uh, uh, the, the nature of uh, God, just like a painting or a, a, a piece of architecture. You know, whatever it is, it, it just reveals the skill, uh, uh, the, the talent, the, the mindset, uh, or the creativity of the artist or the architect who brings about a creation or a piece of architecture or a piece of uh, a painting. The same way, you know, creation is an expression of who God is himself. So the invisible attributes of God, his eternal power, his infinite finite nature, his wisdom, his life, is uh, that he is light, that he has life in himself, he is self-existent, all who he is, all of his nature uh, is expressed in his creation as we read in Romans chapter 1 verse 20. So can one of you please read Romans chapter 1 verse 20 please? Romans chapter 1 verse 20 for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being and un being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that so that they are without excuse amen so here Paul is writing and saying hey you Jews you know you have the law so you know, the Gentiles can say, we didn't know God because we didn't know, we didn't have the law. Uh, but he says, you know, no one is exempt from saying that they, they don't, uh, cannot know God because creation in itself reveals the invisible attributes of God. It can be clearly seen in creation. Can creation, uh, if you look at creation, we can understand who this eternal God is. So, you know, in creation, the limitless, the unending, the infinite power of God was released in his creation. So creation itself re reveals or helps us to know that uh, this God who created it is limitless, unending and infinite in his um, Power. And we know that God is infinite, uh, his, uh, the at, his attributes are infinite, and it's all seen in uh, creation as well. And we also know that uh, this triune God who created everything, you know, it, in the beginning of time, uh, opposed all things by the power of his word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 uh, and specifically verse 3 says, you know, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his son, person and upholding all things by the word of his power. We studied this and we looked at this reference in one of our lessons, uh, previous lessons. Uh, so we see that, you know, uh, this eternal God, uh, the eternal word also upholds all things just through the power of his word. So the entire universe is being held up by the power of his word, which means God's word is so powerful and God's word is still, the power of his word is still at work in the universe. So when this great I am, you know, put everything into place, saw everything and brought about the, uh, in the beginning of time, brought about creation, then the, the triune God, the Godhead, went on to create a uh, man. And we know that from Genesis chapter 
1 and 2 that uh, God created Adam and Eve in his own image to be part of his own family. Uh, but we know that Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire human race into sin, uh, into subjection to Satan, moral decay and corruption. But God was not taken aback. He was not surprised. Uh, you know, um, uh, God did not say, oh, oh, what, what went wrong? What happened? You know, um, but he let it be for some time. He knew all of this would be delivered from bondage, from corruption. All of this will be restored back to its original straight state, to its original purpose, to its original design. And so he was not taken aback. He was not alarmed. He was not, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 he said he didn't, he didn't, I mean, he's kind of, he did not feel that, oh, he's lost control of things now. No, he was broke. He was sad in his heart, but he knew that this is going to happen. He was, he must have been grieved in his heart because man chose to sin, but he had, you know, the whole plan of redemption was already completed. He knew that everything is going to be delivered from bondage, from corruption, to be restored to its original state of design, purpose, beauty, and to its um, uh, glory. Like we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 23. Can one of you read, please read Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 23, please? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know the that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Amen. So here we see that creation was subjected to everything that was corrupt, bad, to futility because of sin, uh, you know, to corruption. But there is hope that God is going to deliver everything uh, from corruption back to its glorious liberty. And not only creation, but all of us will also, you know, uh, be adopted as sons and daughters and also will have the redemption of our body. So when Adam and Eve sinned, it was not something that God felt utterly hopeless and lost control, but he already had the plan of salvation. And at the Pointed time at the Kairos time, the Son of God, who already had, who already even before the foundation of the world, said that he would, uh, you know, become that God incarnate. He would become that Lamb of God who takes on the sins of the world, who would make that perfect sacrifice, and already, you know, completed it in the heart and the mind of God. He at the Kairos moment was revealed to us, was made manifest to us. The eternal Word became uh, the Son of God, as we read in John chapter one, verse fourteen and thirty-four. Verse fourteen, we've already looked at it, studied this verse a couple of times. In the first two lessons, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of one and only of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and uh, truth. And verse 34 says, and have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John and the disciples, other disciples are saying, hey, we have seen him. We testify and we know that he is the son of God. So at the Kairos moment, at the right moment, you know, um, the son of God, the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity limited himself to being a human being. Uh, you know, um, uh, we read this in uh, Luke, uh, you know, in Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35, uh, Mary says to the angel, how can this be since I, you know, I am not uh, married, I have not known any man. And the angel said to her that the Holy Spirit will come upon her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her. And therefore, the one that was to be born to her uh, will be a holy one and he will be called the Son of God. Okay, so uh, we see that God becomes 
the Son of God becomes incarnate, uh, and he limits himself to being a human being. And um, you know, uh, we see that the first uh, Adam, uh, uh, who's also referred to as the first man uh, and the natural man, put us under sin, put us under death, put us under uh, curse, put us under the uh, dominion of uh, Satan, but we see that uh, Jesus is referred to as the last Adam, uh, whereas, uh, you know, Adam is referred to the first Adam, and Jesus is also referred to as the second man, uh, whereas Adam is referred to as the first man, and Jesus is referred to as the heavenly man uh, in scripture, where, uh, you know, Adam is referred to as the uh, natural man, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 and verses 47 to 48. So the first man, Adam, you know, became a living being, uh, but the last Adam, referring to Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And verse 48 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, as was the man of dust, that is referring to Adam, so are also those who are made of dust. But as is the heavenly man, which is referring to Jesus Christ, are also those who are heavenly. So we inherited a na the nature of the first Adam, the first man, the natural man, we inherited uh, death, we sin, we inherited death, we inherited curses, we inherited uh, being slaves of Satan. But, you know, uh, from the uh, last Adam, the second man, and the heavenly man, who is referred to as Jesus Christ, uh, we uh, received, you know, uh, life eternal, we received the Zoe life of God, the eternal life of God, we received the blessings of God, the fullness of his life, the blessing of heaven, and also the assurance of eternal uh, life. So we'll stop here. Uh, sorry, I've just taken two minutes. I kind of got uh, taken away with uh, this whole thing and uh, I didn't uh, see the time. We'll stop here. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we'll end class. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next week will be our last week because we just finished uh, uh, this lesson. And uh, then we'll decide when we can have our last uh, assessment for the uh, online students. Okay, so enjoy this um, this uh, week, Passion Week, and leading to Good Friday and uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Um, you know, may the power of the cross and everything that what Christ has accomplished come alive. Um, happy Resurrection Sunday and happy Easter to all of you. God bless you all. Thank you.